So you asked the question, um, you know, what is it that we ought to be doing um, in terms of uh, treating um, these organisms with respect and yet uh, defending ourselves? And I guess I would answer that, yeah, we ought to defend ourselves. We ought to defend uh, our food system. We ought to defend ourselves from disease. Um, but we want to do that in the smartest way possible not necessarily in the most efficient or cost effective but in the in the in a way that respects the other organisms as well as respecting ourselves Forum coming to you live via Zoom for the very first time. I'm Mary Stack, the Director of Cambridge Forum, and today's topic is a good one for us to all contemplate while we're in lockdown mode. Is there a better way to coexist with the smaller life forms on the planet, the weeds and the pests in our own backyards? Massive overuse of pesticides in agriculture and in our own gardens has combined with accelerated climate change and they've resulted in a spectacular decline in insect populations. Germany has measured a loss of 75% of its flying insects in the past 20 years, and bees are in the front line. Last month, we witnessed East Africa undergoing a locust plague of biblical proportions, which threatened the already food-strapped population. At the other end of the spectrum, we saw the raging Australian forest fires decimate billions of indigenous species and countless acres of native forest and farmland. Well, first, let's start with John up there in the Northwest. It might surprise many people to hear that you were once a pesticide developer, John. What brought about your salvation or transformation and why did you write the book? Well, thank you, Mary. I want to, I want to also uh, thank the Cambridge Forum and uh, for the opportunity to have this conversation with you and Jim. And, an opportunity to talk about uh, nature underfoot and, and the small, uh, often unappreciated plants and animals that surround us. You asked how I came about writing this book. Um, it was by a rather circuitous route. I, obviously, I started, as you mentioned, uh, many years ago, um, working in the pesticide industry. I am an entomologist and I care a lot about insects and their kin. And, uh, but yet I, I had this, uh, the jo this job that uh, involved killing them. And uh, over time, sadly, killing quite a few of them. You might say I got religion, uh, in effect. Um, after uh, I retired uh, early uh, from the, the pesticide industry, I ended up going back to school and uh, pursued a graduate degree in religion at Yale University um, with a concentration in ethics. And uh, my particular interest was environmental ethics. And I would say that it was there that the ideas for the themes in this book began to develop. And it was there that I really began to confront um, the value of some of these organisms, some of these smaller organisms that uh, often aren't highly valued. And so that began to um, give me the idea of, you know, what is there that I can do about this? What can I contribute to this conversation? And that led to uh, nature underfoot. Um, I, uh, in my opening remarks, I'd like to actually read a little bit from the book. Uh, to sort of uh, provide as a guide. So I've brought it along here. Well, here I am at home. I have a couple of copies. Um, and I'm going to read from the first chapter, um, which is entitled Anthropocene Winners. Now, as, as you may know, the Anthropocene has been proposed as a name for our current geologic epoch. It's a time in which human changes outstrip non-human, or what we might call natural changes. Human beings are changing landforms, they're changing waterways, they're changing the distribution of plants and animals 
and also the composition of our atmosphere as we see it's related to climate change. So the Anthropocene seems an appropriate title um, for the kind of thing I want to write about. In fact, Nature Underfoot, the book, also features chapters on Anthropocene extinctions and Anthropocene invasions, not just the Anthropocene winners. The Anthropocene winners in my book in this first chapter are smaller organisms that have successfully adapted to living with human beings and have followed us around the world. They're represented in the first chapter by silverfish, an insect, dandelions, fruit flies, and crabgrass. So let me start from the very beginning of the book in the first chapter. They meet in the basement where it is suitably damp and dark behind boxes of discarded clothing and toys. The first touch is electric. It arises from the mutual contact of antennae. Don't worry, it's consensual. They touch antennae, retreat and return, and retreat and return again. They may bob their heads. The feeling of mutual attraction grows, and they go for a stroll where the damp cement floor meets cinder block wall. Perhaps a chase is involved, male chasing female or vice versa. As they become more confident in their relationship, he lays a mat of silken threads before her where he provides a nuptial gift. When she reaches the mat, the threads stimulate her to search for the gift with her tail. And when found, she grasps the package of sperm with the ovipositor at the tip of her tail. On the whole, it's a rather chaste interaction of male and female that lasts about half an hour. Sperm are transferred without intercourse. So goes the mating ritual of the silverfish, a perfectly ordinary household insect that is found in the largest cities and down on the farm. One can find silverfish in locations all over the house in habitats that we create for them. We know them by their slippery quick movements, their elongate silvery appearance, long antennae, and three tails. Silverfish, something so small, so seemingly simple, but in reality, they are so complex and intriguing. But there's much, much more. Let me read uh, the last page or so of this chapter. So I return indoors to my bookshelf, which I seem to be sharing with the silverfish. Here I find that Aristotle, the father of biology, contends we should venture on the study of every kind of animal without distaste, for each and all will reveal to us something natural and something beautiful. Like if we look closely, nature will reveal something beautiful in the most unexpected places. It may be at home, in a yard, or in a crack in the sidewalk. The roadside and a vacant lot are paradigmatic environments in the Anthropocene. It is here that we find plants and animals that are well known to us, but are unexpectedly beautiful. And beauty not simply in appearance, but also found in the appreciation of multiple adaptations that have led to evolutionary success. It's not readily apparent when you see them that silverfish have an elaborate mating ritual or that they could learn to navigate a complicated maze. Dandelions can definitely be an irritation in lawns and flower beds, but you have to admire how their beautiful floating seeds, long taproot, and rosette leaf arrangement equal success in human habitats. Who would think that the tiny fruit fly might be so similar to humans and also might provide critical scientific information that enables us to practice better medicine? And what of crabgrass, an ancient human food source that has followed us around the planet and lives unbidden in continued close connection to us? These are lives that can provide enchantment, just like the more charismatic organisms found in national parks, zoos, or botanical gardens. Silverfish, dandelions, fruit flies, and crabgrass are but a microcosm of the communities of plants, animals, and microorganisms that we create around us 
in the Anthropocene. We are up against them and they're living right up against us. We are cheek by jowl or perhaps cheek by antenna with a nature of our own making. It is wild nature pursuing its own ends in our homes and gardens. It is wild nature in our basement where two silverfish meet at the intersection of damp cement floor and concrete block wall, shyly touching antenna. So that's the first chapter. So why would a person write what, about silverfish when there are so many other more glamorous insects like monarch butterflies or cockroaches or bumblebees? Well, I do include bumblebees in the book. But when we learn a little bit more about these commonplace organisms, I think we find they are glamorous in their own right. Um, my purpose in writing Nature Underfoot, uh, as I mentioned, was to generate a greater awareness of these small organisms. And I hope that awareness then will lead to a greater appreciation and then to even respect. And respect is sorely needed today. Um, insects, as Mary mentioned, are in decline all over the world. For example, studies published in uh, scientific journals over the last month point to the global loss of both firefly and bumblebee species. In Nature Underfoot, I talk about the plight of the American burying beetle, the Heinz emerald dragonfly, uh, no relation, uh, different spelling, the Franciscan manzanita, and the large blue butterfly in the United Kingdom. All of them endangered. And respect is sorely needed today. Insects in particular are in decline all over the world. For example, studies published in scientific journals over the last month point to the global loss of both firefly and bumblebee species. In Nature Underfoot, I talk about the plight of the American burying beetle, the Heinz emerald dragonfly, and that's no relation, a uh, different spelling, the Franciscan manzanita, and the large blue butterfly in the United Kingdom. All of them are endangered. I think it's time to reckon with how we humans relate to these smaller organisms. I recently read about the concept of plant blindness in which many of us don't notice the plants we pass by. Similarly, I believe that other smaller organisms may simply be a backdrop to our lives if they are noticed at all. And if noticed, many of us approach them with feelings of fear and disgust. I submit that there are reasons to think otherwise and would like to shift those emotions in a more positive direction. I know from reading Jim's book, My Backyard Jungle, that he has similar feelings as well. Okay, well. So I'm looking forward to I would think, like to turn it back to Mary. I think um, you covered a lot of really interesting points there. Um, I'm not sure I could fall in love with the silverfish. Ah. Maybe, I, I'd have to work on it. <laughs> But um, James, let, let's hear your, a little bit about your experiences and why you wrote the book um, and how you learned to coexist with some of the variety of things you encountered in, in your house in South Carolina. Sure. Well, maybe I'll just start with a little bit of background about how, we came, how I came to write the book. Um, you know, we, I had done a lot of work in ecological restoration on other people in the schoolyards and other, other uh, landscapes. Um, but we moved to Columbia, South Carolina and uh, bought our first house here. And, um, you know, I think uh, that provided the opportunity for me to um, begin to think about what, what did I want to do with this space given, you know, sort of my background in ecological restoration. Um, and I started to, you know, sort of take stock of what was here. It was about a quarter of an acre uh, lot. So pretty typical space in a lot of ways, not completely downtown, but not out in the suburbs either. So sort of an urban space. We had some mature trees, um, but uh, it certainly uh, was not, um, in many ways, it was a, a blank canvas. A lot, of, a lot of the lawn had been just abandoned um, or sprayed with herbicides. So there was a lot of 
spare soil. And so I, I saw it as really a kind of a, a, a place to begin to um, experiment on, on, on what you could do with this space in an urban context. And, and really to start with, I uh, you know, was sort of inspired by uh, Aldo Leopold's famous land ethic, um, in particular thinking about the three principles that he mentions, um, which are uh, integrity, stability, and beauty and how those might play out uh, in an urban context. Um, so I started, I had two ideas in mind, I think. I wanted to create a kind of uh, mini wilderness, uh, you know, a place where the kids could catch fireflies and see all different kinds of wild creatures um, encounter those uh, in the space. But I also wanted to create a kind of pastoral landscape or a garden uh, where the kids could you know, hard pick strawberries and do, uh, you know, kind of gardening as well. Um, so I had two very distinct kind of carefully kind of delineated landscapes uh, with what I saw as clear boundaries uh, in the yard. Um, <clears throat> and uh, from there, um, walking around the neighborhood, I'd, I'd heard before about the National Wildlife Federation's uh, certification process. Um, I saw someone else had a, a sign in their yard and I thought, you know, that, that's a good way for me to kind of signpost what I'm doing uh, to the neighborhood. It's not because it's not going to look like uh, aesthetically, it's not going to look the kind of beauty that we're creating here, uh, such as it is, isn't going to look like a kind of conventional uh, aesthetic. So I, I thought that a sign sort of proclaiming this is certified wild, wildlife habitat would be useful. Um, so the Wildlife Federation had several criteria. Uh, that you had to use to uh, or, or create in your yard. And, and the bar is meant to be fairly low. You have to uh, provide food, water, a place to raise young, um, <clears throat> and a uh, place to, to sort of hide were the big, uh, four big precepts for, for creating this habitat. Um, so I started digging things up. I started planting things. Um, and then, um, you know, the plants began to grow. The wildlife habitat began to develop. And that's when uh, the wildlife began to show up, and uh, that's when um, things began to get interesting, I suppose. Um, we had all sorts of fruit trees, we had strawberries, we had all kinds of crops, and of course the uh, wildlife sort of looked at that and said, oh great, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Strawberries, I'll, I'll, I'll enjoy those. In fact, I'll take all of those um, and not leave any for you. So immediately, you know, there are these conflicts over uh, peaches on the trees that the squirrels are eating or strawberries that the birds were getting and what, how I was going to uh, deal with, you know, creatures moving from the, what I saw as the wilderness area and moving into the garden area. How was I going to kind of keep, keep things where, they, where I thought they should be? Um, and of course, the wildlife didn't stop uh, at, the, at the sort of door either. They, were, they started Immediately, we began to hearing noises at night, uh, 4 a.m. in the morning, um, and, and as the parents of two small children, you know, sleep is kind of precious. So that immediately hearing these creatures underneath our tub at 4 in the morning immediately sort of raised kind of issues of like, well, you know, wait a minute, they're not, this wildlife habitat is, is not stopping where it's supposed to stop. We, this is our habitat. That's their habitat. They're not sort of respecting our boundaries. Um, so we had to, um, these kind of questions I think made it more interesting and made me sort of realize, you know, that there's got to be people who are dealing with these issues in, in a variety of ways, not just me with possums or, or rats or raccoons, but people all over who must be dealing with this. And so I started looking, um, looking for, for lessons really about how people were coexisting with these other species. Um, and realizing that in different locations all around the world, people were negotiating these kind of um, coexistence issues with other species in urban contexts. Um, and I uh, began to travel um, and explore these issues in different cities around the world, um, looking for lessons about how to coexist in an urban context. Um, the first, I think, lesson I learned, so, and this comes from traveling to Delhi where people are living with rhesus macaques, um, Rio de Janeiro, where people are living with marmosets, um, Northampton, Massachusetts, not far from Cambridge, where uh, black bears kind of roam the urban landscape. Um, <clears throat> it occurred to me that, you know, one of the things I was learning was that coexistence is kind of an ongoing uh, 
negotiation and there are ways that we can figure out really on a species by species basis in specific locations how to negotiate that question. Um, and I think it's become more trenchant now as we sort of see, uh, you know, I'm talking to you at home because of, of this wildlife transmitted uh, disease. And, and that was something in my travels that I, that I encountered. I remember um, in Rio in particular, uh, seeing that this was actually a two-way street, that the marmosets, we, when we visited um, wildlife hospitals where a number of these uh, marmosets would come in, um, they, would, they would often come in with uh, suffering from a human uh, herpes virus. So people would see these uh, creatures on the street, they would give them a bite of an apple or something. And of course, if they had a cold sore or something like that, that would uh, infect these marmosets who had no uh, resistance, it was a fatal disease for them. So uh, people would then find them on the sidewalk and bring them into the hospital. Um, also though, we had creatures coming into our, uh, our house. Um, and I remember going out with a, with a wildlife uh, removal kind of crew uh, who, you know, come, come, they kind of go around and um, remove wildlife, prevent wildlife from entering, entering people's houses in Colombia. And they, uh, you know, they basically said, you know, we, we sterilize these cages, we, we do a, a lot of different work to try and prevent stuff, you know, catching stuff, but we've probably been exposed to everything crawling around and underneath your house kind of thing, um, you know, including raccoon roundworm, which has these, uh, they're the eggs of these, you have to heat the cage, any, any, any kind of tool or any kind of exposure up to 140 degrees to try and get rid of it. Um, so there are, you know, issues, uh, in a, in a kind of disease context um, with coexistence. But again, I think it's sort of how do you negotiate these issues is something that you can think about on a, on a particular granular kind of basis. Um, the other thing that I thought about was um, <clears throat> some species then are, are easier to live with than others. Um, black bears surprise me um, given the number of conflicts and, and my expectations um, were far lower uh, than I would have thought. Um, whereas something like a rhesus macaque uh, I was amazed really what, with what people were willing to live with um, in these cities where these large groups of, of, of monkeys would appear in a neighborhood and leap from balcony to balcony, actually trying the doors to see if they could kind of break into the house and get into the kitchen. I remember witnessing this from my hotel balcony and just thinking, this is just, how can people live with this? This is terrifying. Um, so I think each species presents its own uh, unique kind of challenges. Um, and I think it's important to sort of see those within that light rather than sort of categorizing broadly. Um, and the third, the third issue, and this, this pertains, I think, to, to beauty, is that um, urban landscapes are their own kind of landscape. They're, they're uh, kind of novel ecosystems. They're not wilderness, they're not a garden, they're, they're their own kind of distinctive place. And so uh, thinking about what the aesthetics of that place is, what can thrive there, um, <clears throat> those are the kind of questions that I ultimately arrived, where I ultimately arrived uh, with those kind of questions. Um, <clears throat> and I think we need to develop further a kind of sense of ethics that can work in those kind of landscapes where more and more people are going to be living uh, in the future um, and also coming into contact with various uh, wild species. Um, so, you know, ultimately, I think I had to adapt Leopold's famous kind of three uh, precepts. And so instead of um, integrity, I started thinking about diversity. How can I maximize diversity of species in this landscape? Um, bearing in mind that it's not gonna, there, it's not gonna be a sort of, here's my wilderness, here's my garden kind of dynamic that, species are gonna move around. Um, instead of stability, I was thinking about resilience. What can, how can I allow these species to have the kind of habitat they need to kind of, um, rather than for stay the same, it's gonna change over time, it's going to evolve. How can I kind of incorporate those kind of, that kind of idea of change in this landscape, this urban context? And then finally, uh, with beauty, I wanted to, to define that on uh, its own terms for an urban context. So whether it's a hell strip or a sort of uh, the, the, the sort of strip that goes right by the driveway, whatever it is, I wanted to think about what, 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 would, what would be the aesthetic that it allows other species to thrive in this context. It won't look 
like a conventional yard, but it can it still be something where people look at it and say, oh, that's interesting, that's intriguing. Um, so those were the values where I arrived. And I think that, that um, that's probably a good place to dovetail with John's thinking about how can we kind of live with these other uh, species as well. So I think there's lots of questions there. Um, I think the idea of beauty is one, you know, we've, we've kind of got this, we talked about this, I know before, about the sterilized view of the world. You know, everything's got to be pristine and somewhat organized and not messy. Yeah. I remember a neighbor once telling me he was taking down the apple tree in his yard because it made too much mess. Mm. I had never heard anyone refer to an apple tree making mess, beautiful yes. blooms, the fruit. Right. So I, I think this uh, version of, uh, you know, the, it's, it's, it's almost like a Disney version of what the perfect mm -hmm. heart, the yard is and right. it's right. not really real. And mm -hmm. so that's one thing, we're gonna have to change our idea of what beauty and acceptance is. Right. Then what do you do, um, to maintain, well, I mean, you say you have to take it on a case by case basis. Yeah. Um, so that's a big question. So do you want to jump in with that? Do you want me to jump in with that? Sure. Um, yeah, how, sure. How, do you, how do you maintain uh, beauty on a, on a case by case basis? Well, yeah, I think again, you're sort of thinking what, what, what's going to work in this particular context. I, I, I tend to think about our yard being in uh, you know, the, the kind of subtropics here in South Carolina, but also being on the edge of really what's a prehistoric beach. Uh, it's called the Sand Hills. So uh, our soil is virtually pure sand. We're, we're kind of on a giant sand dune. Um, certain plants thrive there. Others, you have to work really, really hard uh, to keep them alive. Um, plants that need a lot of water here um, in the summer when it's very hot, um, require a lot of work to keep those alive, keep them green and looking kind of fresh. Others, uh, you know, um, work really, really well. They don't need a lot of water. They deal well with heat. They deal well with humidity. Um, and so I've, I've tried to lean into those kind of, those kind of aesthetic choices. Um, those in turn will nurture other communities of species. Um, and it also, though, however, means that certain species are not going to be flocking to my particular particular yard. In other words, not everything is gonna work in my specific landscape. Um, I think aesthetically, it's important to think about not just uh, you know, kind of conventional uh, flowering kind of spaces, but I, I know, for example, recently I was driving past uh, a yard that I, I, I don't know if anyone was living there. It was, it, it, conventionally it looked like, you know, they just hadn't done any work to the yard. It was mostly bare dirt. And, and as I stopped at the stop sign, I realized this, this yard, this bare dirt is actually throbbing with ground nesting bees. I mean, there are thousands of ground nesting bees. And it made me reflect on, you know, I've spent countless hours trying to remove all the bare patches in our yard uh, and make sure that plants can, can kind of grow there. But there's actually a kind of habitat value even to having bare soil uh, in your yard. And so I think reevaluating that notion, that aesthetic of, of what's beautiful in terms of what can live there versus what we sort of conventionally appreciate. It also means, I think, that we, we're not applying the lens of this is a pristine, uh, you know, wilderness-based uh, ideal that we're looking at, at the urban landscape and saying, well, this doesn't really matter because it's not Yellowstone. So, you know, um, whatever I can do here is just going to be kind of um, less than, than, than an actual national park. I think that we, what we should be thinking about is what's possible in this landscape and, and validating that particular landscape. Um, and I think a lot can be done. Um, what's surprised me over time since the book has been written is just the number of species. Each year, new and different species uh, show up in our yard. Um, some of which, and they, they have community kind of based impacts. So uh, recently we've had a lot of garter snakes show up um, and uh, we consequently have had a lot fewer toads uh, in our yard. Uh, we've also had for the first time, I, I found a, a box turtle baby. It was about two inches long uh, in our yard. Um, I don't know where, again, I don't know where it came from, where, where uh, it 
arrived from, but it, it has discovered our yard and sort of spent all of last summer uh, wandering around our, our, our yard. Um, so things show up, um, but and those have consequences in that landscape. So it's constantly changing and evolving uh, as well. So um, moving away from the aesthetic, which of course is important, but function mm -hmm. is also important, like the milkweed and yeah, serves exactly. a function. Sure. John, what about, I mean, silverfish aside, what, what is the, the end solution? Or if we look at the situation now with the coronavirus, which has come about partly due to the fact that we've got this mix of uh, animals in the wrong environment, close to humans, and bats, as we know, you know, they're enormous vectors of disease. And on the one hand, you know, I know that some places that they're being wiped out, and others, they're actually moving big time into downtown settings like Sydney has a big problem with bats. Mm -hmm. So how do, how do you maintain the gospel of all God's creatures, great and small, and at the same time, try and exercise smart restraint with, with regard to these unknown microbes we're now going to introduce into our system? So I know it's a big question, but what would you say to that? Well, I think, um, I think to begin, uh, Jim touches on um, sort of a key issue as he talks about encountering different organisms, different creatures over time. Now, some of that's year by year, differences in climate. Human beings, though, generally, globally, are living in closer and closer association with wildlife as we convert their habitat into our own. And when that happens, uh, unexpected uh, things may occur. Uh, and Ebola virus is a great example of that, uh, where human beings uh, moved uh, into previously, what were previously wild jungle areas and uh, became more easily exposed uh, to Ebola virus. So it's part of, over, of overall changes to the ecosystem. And some of those uh, endanger human beings, others of those endanger the other organisms um, and result in extinctions, uh, like I mentioned earlier. Um, we engage in habitat destruction, habitat fragmentation, where we, we carve up the habitat so small for an organism that it can't survive. Um, pesticides uh, obviously uh, change the ecosystem uh, to a great extent, especially when applied over large areas. And then climate change is changing, really changing our exposure to disease as well as uh, disease carrying organisms or disease vectors like mosquitoes, like ticks that may have been um, tropical or subtropical now move up into more temperate climate areas. Mm -hmm. So you ask the question, um, you know, what is it that we ought to be doing um, in terms of uh, treating um, these organisms with respect and yet uh, defending ourselves? And I guess I would answer that, yeah, we ought to defend ourselves. We ought to defend uh, our food system. We ought to defend ourselves from disease. Um, but we want to do that in the smartest way possible, not necessarily in the most efficient or cost effective, but in, the, in, the, in a way that respects the other organisms as well as respecting ourselves. Um, big general idea, but I, th I think in many cases you can see that that's very possible. Um, we tend towards the economic or the um, efficient, in the economic or efficient direction, but I think we need to, to keep the uh, other organisms in mind uh, and treat them respect, respectfully as, as well, remembering that we have a right to defend ourselves. But in a situation like a marketplace, which I'm sure there are, I can't even imagine how many marketplaces like that exist in, in, play, in Asia. Mm -hmm. um, is, it, is it something the World Health Organization should actually come in and kind of create mandates about? Um, to stop these things happening. I mean, like, you know, in this country, you don't have raw food and chilled food or in the same section of a supermarket. I mean, there's certain rules you don't cross. Um, 
or, or, or is this something cultural that people are not going to get? Do you think people are going to get this and, and actually not repeat the exercise? Um, I mean, that, it, it's kind of um, a huge education process that we're talking about, really. It really is. I've been through some of those markets uh, I, that I think you're referring to, say, mm. in China. Um, and uh, in one way, uh, as an uh, as, uh, entomologist and someone interested in wildlife, they're fascinating. Um, I, think, I think that this is something that um, we will all have to be looking at as we pass through this, uh, this epidemic and, and thinking about. Um, and I think, you know, not just people in Asia, but people in the United States are going to have to reflect uh, um, on how we are living and um, how we react uh, in an in a environment such as the one we find ourselves in today. And I think your point is a good one because of climate change, um, because of global pesticide use, we've created this environment which is, is in no way natural. And it's even more unnatural with each decade because of development and communities losing their green space. You know, we are having bees on our rooftops and having to make these nice layered farms, layered, you know, those solar panels with farms. In many cities, they do that. So, I mean, this is a chance for innovation here. M many opportunities for innovation. But uh, I think what we value and what we're willing to do. For example, to acknowledge that we travel more than we've ever traveled before, unnecessarily perhaps, globally, and can transmit things at the speed of light. You know, this, this didn't happen in previous periods in history just because of the physical logistics that restricted that possibility. Now, things can travel within hours to all corners of the, of the, the planet. So do you think this is going to change people's understanding of just their, their ecosystem and their place in it? Well, there's no doubt that this is a great time for reflection. Um, how far that will go, it's really hard to say. I'd be curious to know what Jim thinks too, because he's had a lot of international experience. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I mentioned earlier that uh, I have a chapter in my book I call Anthropocene Invasions. And really what that reflects is how we carry some of these organisms that are so successful uh, in living with us, how we carry them around the world. I mean, dandelions are not from North America. Uh, and um, so they have found their way along with us around the world. Um, same is, uh, is true for some of the cockroaches. Um, same is true for um, okay. fruit flies. So mm -hmm. we, we carry these things around the world. In fact, fruit flies are a great example of an organism that is actually more at home now with us than it is in its own uh, natural environment. They're, they're much more successful living with human beings than they are in Africa where they originated. Mm -hmm. So Jim, you can have the last word on this if, if you oh. like. Well, you know, I, again, I, I, I tend to think that this is just, it's, it's a question of, of, of practices of, of negotiation and coexistence. Um, I think there are some species that we can find ways to live with and others where we uh, really struggle. And so um, I, I, I think there's probably gonna be an instinct to sort of say, uh, let's get rid of, you know, we don't want wildlife animals in the city. That is, uh, we, can't, we can't have any contact with these other species. They might, uh, they, they might give us a disease, they might threaten us somehow. But notice, but then again, you sort of think about how sterile our existence would be without uh, the way that these other species enrich our lives, particularly in a city where um, we don't have access necessarily to a, you know, kind of wild area. Um, and so I think it is an, an ongoing kind of negotiation of how can we live with these other species um, in ways that are mutually kind of acceptable. Um, there, it's never going to be a kind of ideal si situation. We, we have kind of different needs, different, and we're constantly negotiating those. But I think if we can develop the kind of practices where um, other species can kind of thrive and we can thrive too, um, 
I think that that's really the kind of uh, situation that we want to want to pursue. Um, in particular, I think it, it just in terms of my own uh, book and, and working with the people who do the kind of wildlife kind of um, management in the city, I suppose, is what they really are up to. A lot of what the work that they're doing is really construction work. They're, they're closing off all the avenues that allow wildlife to get into the house uh, and treat the house as their nest instead of our nest. Um, and so if you can, you know, that's a way of sort of saying, okay, here are the boundaries. You're, you kind of are using that space out there. This is our space in here. And we don't sort of uh, share that kind of space. Um, and I think in a way that it's those kind of negotiations that we're thinking about how, where, where can we kind of share space in ways that, that, that work for both of us and where do we kind of have to delineate these kind of separate spaces. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a way that, that, that hopefully we'll begin to handle this um, instead of uh, reaching a, a stage where it's like, no, we can't have any uh, animals uh, in proximity to us because there might be a kind of disease that's transmitted. And to get your neighbors to fully um, appreciate your long grass and your meadow. Right, right. Well, and again, they're manicured. I don't think, I don't think anybody would, it would be too happy if I, if I just, you know, put in some honeybee hives right on our, right on the edge of the, the privacy fence and said, okay, from now on, we're going to have, you know, 40,000 uh, uh, bees right on, right on the edge of our property. You know, I, I think there are ways to negotiate with the, with the neighbors as well. That kind of, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, I've really, really enjoyed this discussion. I'm sure all the people that are going to tune into this are going to learn a lot and go out and buy your books, hopefully. So I'm going to once again thank uh, John Hines um, from Seattle with his book, Nature Underfoot, um, James Barilla, who wrote My Backyard Jungle, who came to us from the University of South Carolina. And I just wanted to say that Cambridge Forum is made possible through the generosity of Herbert and Dorothy Vetter. It's sponsored by the Lowell Institute, the Ford Hall Forum, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, Harvard Bookstore, and First Parish Church in Cambridge. So thank you all for joining us for this very interesting discussion. And I hope that we'll Zoom with you again soon. And goodbye and stay healthy. <laughs> <laughs>